so uh, as Daniel mentioned, I'm Ed Delp. I'm from Purdue uh, University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning here, just to describe how we got into this. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the whole team that's working on this particular project. So you see, we have a, uh, I am the co-principal investigator in Longwood Wall from the uh, uh, USC ISI. And so we have people from uh, the University of Naples. We have people from the University of Notre Dame, uh, the University of Comparis uh, in uh, Brazil, and also the uh, Polytechnical uh, University in Milan. So this group, we, we really have been working on this problems of media and semantic forensics. Uh, some of us, personally me, I've been working on these problems for almost 20 years. Uh, many, many people on our team have also been working on these problems uh, for a long time. And a couple of years ago, this problem of scientific integrity was brought to our attention. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, uh, we were part of a very large DARPA program called Metaphor, which was stood for Met Media Forensics. Uh, and Matt Turek, who is the program uh, director of that, is going to speak tomorrow. Uh, as part of that metaphor problem, um, I, I believe if I got the story straight, and, and Wanda can correct me maybe in the questions and answer if I got it wrong, but Wanda and her group uh, brought this problem to Matt. Uh, it's what DARPA called a challenge problem. Our team worked on it. Um, and then after that, uh, both uh, DARPA and HHS decided to fund some of the research we're doing. Uh, this now is extended into the newer program called Semaphore, which stands for Se Semantic Forensics. And some of that work that's in Semaphore is also beginning uh, to impact this work that we're doing for uh, ONR, uh, ORI. Uh, um, and I'll say some more about that towards the end of my talk. So um, there's standard disclaimer. This is what I'm going to say here is my opinions and do not recognize any of our funding agencies. Um, we, I, I don't think I need to say anything about this. Everybody knows about that. The fact there's, everybody's talked about this. The, there's large amounts of, um, uh, of redacted papers. We see more and more of these with COVID. We've seen a, a lot, lot um, even more. Uh, this was a graph one of my graduate students got. And you can see that, um, 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 you know, the, the number of papers that have been retracted are, are growing more and more. And, Again, I, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think everybody understands that. So, uh, you know, here's an example of the types of things that we are particularly interested in. Uh, here's a particular paper that was retracted. And one of the things that we're very interested in, among other things, is looking at the images and the, uh, and the graphs and, and also the text. But, you know, many of our tools initially look at the images. Uh, and this is, of course, is a Western blot image. And you can see how this particular image um, has been changed or, or manipulated. Um, so what, what are we doing, okay? So we want to use modern tools from media and semantic forensics to detect whether an image published, uh, and I, when I mean image, also graphics, published in a scientific paper ha have possibly been altered, okay? So we are working on four sort of, four sort of large tasks, and that is we're looking at image, graphs, and other illustrations. Um, we know that these, uh, these things are often used to summarize results in sort of a compact fashion. And they've also been um, some you know, work indicating uh, that these things can be manipulated. We're also very much interested in the labels pr present on the images and related to the image. And we're also looking at semantic gaps uh, in cases of, uh, you know, of image duplication and things along that line. Uh, but much more importantly is we have an integrated prototype system that we've actually stood up. Uh, and it is, uh, it, you know, we're continuously in, improving it. And this is it. So the system has a very simple to use and highly configurable graphical front end. Um, a user would go to a particular website, they would log in, and then they would be able to, uh, to use this system. Now, one of the things I want to I emphasize in our project is we are not making automatic decisions. Our goal here is to provide information to a scientific integrity analyst, scientific integrity offer, officer, and have them make, of course, make the final decision. So we do have some automated tools, but they present options and results to the analysts, and then the analysts can uh, make up their mind about how they want to proceed with the analysis. So the way it works is, let's say, an analyst would have a, specific, uh, a suspicious document, 
uh, PDF file, they would upload that PDF file to our system. Uh, the system maybe because it'd been used a lot has a very large database of other images and other papers. Uh, as soon as the images are uploaded to the system, uh, the PDF file, our system automatically extracts all the images and all the image captions and binds the images with the image captions. It can also then uh, uh, detect, uh, extract images from individual um, uh, you know, uh, groups of images. And we have the capability of labeling the images. So we can label them if they're a Western blot image or a microscope image. And there's a whole collection of, uh, of sets of classes where you can label the images. So that is all done in the background. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, um, all of this, of course, also goes into a very large backend database system uh, that includes audit trails. So we actually uh, know exactly what the analyst has been doing as far as, you know, analyzing the images. Um, the system, this backend database uh, will take SQL calls. It can either generate SQL calls or take SQL calls as an input. So this, our backend database system could be very easily integrated into a, another database system. The system is easily ex extendable. If you don't know what a Docker container is, just think of it as a software component type. Uh, so if you have Docker containers written against a particular application programming interface, they're very easily to uh, be added to the system. And we've been doing that. We've been using results from both the Metaphor and Semaphore uh, DARPA programs to be able to add content into our system as far as uh, new, new, uh, new uh, processing tools. Then we have a bunch of image analysis tools, including content ranking, content segmentation, uh, image editing, uh, copy move detection, provenance analysis, and then some new things that we're going to be adding. I'll tell you it towards the end of my talk. Um, th this has to do with looking at purely synthetic images, and we're starting to see um, some some uh, mention in the in the in the literature about maybe people uh, not taking the real images and manipulating them, but making purely synthetic images uh, using something called GANs. So this is the end-to-end -end system. It's it is operational. Um, it it is operational in a test environment. Um, it is not being used right now by OSI uh, uh, for various legal reasons uh, as far as looking at actual imagery. We are working with OSI to move this into a more of a sequestered environment so, uh, so they would be able to use it internally. As far as being able to do all this, and many of these tools are very sophisticated machine learning tools, we have collected uh, a database. This is version eight of our database. We have collected um, about a thousand papers. I, I should point out to you, these uh, papers have not been supplied to us by uh, HHS ORI or DARPA or AFRL. Uh, these are, uh, this is uh, papers we've collected, our team has collected. Um, we have a, a very sophisticated database for these papers. So for retracted papers, we have the original uh, paper, we have the retraction notice, we have source figures, we have captions and le legends, we have the um, uh, metadata, and also we have some ground truth information that we have done. Uh, so we can use these for helping to train some of our, um, our machine learning tools. We also have regular, uh, what I would call regular published papers. In other words, papers that haven't been retracted. We need this also to be able to train our system. Uh, so for this part of it, we have the original paper, we have the source figures, uh, we have the caption in legends and the metadata. And I also mentioned when I say, um, uh, again, in the captions and legends, and even for the source figures, I'll show a little bit more about uh, what we mean by source figures. So, so this database is the system we're using. It's the number of images uh, we're adding or updating continuously. Uh, probably sometime in the future, we'll have version nine we'll start using uh, for our, our, our study. Um, so let me just mention, uh, I'll just walk you through some of the steps. Uh, and I should point out, our, our team does very, very sophisticated uh, machine learning, image analysis, computer vision, forensic studies. I'm not gonna go into any of the algorithms in great detail. Um, you know, if you wanna know how the actual algorithms work, uh, you, can, you can send us an email, we'll provide you copies of those papers. The whole goal of this talk is just to show you the capabilities of the overall system. So again, uh, you put a, uh, an, a PDF in, and I should point out, uh, we have a feature uh, that we actually stopped working on. If you have older PDFs that were scanned, and they're not, you know, PDFs that say whether they're made, made directly from Word or uh, LaTeX or something like that. We can also take scanned PDFs 
in extracting images and text. Uh, we, we're still doing some work on that, but that feature is in the system. It's actually turned off right now. So we, we take a paper, maybe a suspect paper. We go through and we extract all the images. This is done fully automatically. We have a very nice way of extracting this. We extract all the other metadata. We extract the captions, and then we associate the captions uh, with the figures. And again, depending upon how many figures are in the image, it, you know, that tells you how long it takes. But one of the things an analyst could do is they could upload a bunch of, of, of images, start working maybe a bunch of PDF uh, papers. They could start working on this or maybe some other papers they, they've done. And this is all being done in the background. And the system lets it know when it's, when it's done doing this. Um, one of the things we also do is we su subtract, we separate the subpanels. So here's an input image. Um, this is the basic process, although it's much more complicated than this. And then you can see we have these green squares around here. It tells us we've extracted all of these panels. We also have the capability of taking these images and labeling them what they are. You know, if they're a microscopy image or a Western blot image, we have about seven classes right now. And we're working with ORI to uh, improve that and also improve the accuracy of, of the identification. But we have a version of that feature in this system at, the, at this time. Um, we can also do some very simple one-click uh, functions like um, histogram equalization, auto contrast, color, brightness, gamma, clip, saturation, exposure, noise. These are some basic, um, you can think of them as like Photoshop tools uh, that we've added to the system and they run very quickly. Okay, we also have the capability of content ranking. Now, uh, suppose, uh, I'll make this up, suppose uh, you're an analyst and you're looking at one particular author and you have already in the database some other papers uh, that that particular author had published, you can take one of the images from the current paper under analysis, you can use that as a query, our system then will go look at all the other images in the system and give you a similarity score and a rank of how this image is related uh, to other images that are currently in the system. And we have a similarity score, score metrics, metric. Now, of course, you, the, the system has to be populated and we, we populated the, the system uh, with some of the images in our, in our, our uh, research data set, but it has the capability of doing this. And then you can, uh, you can click on these images and it will tell you where the paper came from. You can even bring up the PDF uh, version of that paper uh, for that particular image. So if you insert this as a query, this image came out with the highest similarity score. You can click on this image it will tell you where that, what paper that came from, bring up the paper. And it could also, if you already had done analysis on that paper, it could tell you something about the analysis. Uh, we also have a very sophisticated copy move detection. This is some of the stuff that uh, um, our group from the University of Naples uh, has contributed to the project. Uh, these, this group has been working on copy move detection for a very long time. Uh, this is really state of the art. It, it came out of some of the work that was done in the, metaphor and, and semaphore program. So it can uh, look at copy and move uh, from images from a common scientific, um, uh, uh, you know, database of scientific papers. So, you know, here's a, a particular image and our method says this, these images have been copied and moved from another image. And then you can, you can then click on these, you can find out where the, it believes the image came from. We've done some, um, uh, we, you know, we can do this for looking at uh, duplication in scientific papers. So. You have, we have an integrated subpanel extraction with, with character recognition and duplication detection is used among the subpanels. So we can actually, you know, label what images, what sections have been duplicated. So we have the capability of doing this. It runs very quickly. Uh, so you give it an image, it splits up the subpanels. It will do detection between couples and then give you a final result. It also will uh, give you labels I think this maybe is a microscopy image. It will give you a label to say that this is a microscopy image. Um, we've, we've done some preliminary detection uh, work on looking at human versus automatic detection. We're not making a grand statement here. I, I just want to mention some of the preliminary results is that we believe that our method uh, can detect more potential duplications in humans. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not pushing that argument real hard. But again, uh, you know, one of the things that our tools look at some very sophisticated and subtle points in the image to be able to extract this information. Um, we've also uh, do some work in, uh, in Providence. 
Uh, this is sort of a non-scientific integrity provenance picture we got from our Notre Dame team. I like it. So it tells you what a provenance graph is and how you can connect all the images together. And we have a provenance uh, uh, tool inside the uh, um, in, inside the the the, the, uh, the our scientific integrity system. So you have a, a query image and a bunch of reference images. We then do some uh, look at some matching, some key point extraction uh, from the computer vision community, and then from those key points, we can then determine where sort of this image came from, and then we can start connecting the the, the dots. So you know we can say that uh, we can extract the key points. We can compare the key points. We come up with an aggregate score, and then we can reference the uh, from rank the reference set based on the similarity scores. So again, this provenance feature, we have a version of the provenance feature that's in the system now. Our Notre Dame team is uh, is working on updating this. Uh, we have a lot of experience with image provenance uh, in our team uh, relative to some of the we were doing in the metaphor and semaphore project. So we do have this provenance feature. Um, we have some new features, in particular synthetic image generation. So I don't know if you've heard about these things called generative adversarial networks or GANs. These have been used to make um, fake images. And I'm actually going to stop here and I'm going to drop out of this share and I'm going to show you something else in case you haven't seen it. So I don't know if you've been to this website, this person does not exist.com. So every time you reload this website, you, the system shows you a person who doesn't exist. This person doesn't exist. This person doesn't exist. This person doesn't exist. So these are all images that are generated by these machine learning tools that are called GANs. And GANs have been used uh, for a lot of applications, let me drop back into my slides, have been used for a lot of applications. Let's see, where am I? Uh, I don't want to start from the beginning. Uh, maybe I can just, well, I'm going to have to do this because let me, I apologize. Let me go forward. So um, this whole idea of looking at GANs, you can also go to this website down here called thisxdoesnotexist.com and you'll see more than just faces. You know, I show you over here, people have been used to generate, you know, uh, um, horses and sheep and all kinds of things, okay? And one of the things that we've seen or we're seeing in some literature people are talking about are people being able to generate um, synthetic uh, biological images, okay? So um, let me show you an example. These are fluorescent microscopy images. These were generated in my lab. Now, I, I wanna make sure you understand that not all GAN generated images are used for bad purposes like faking scientific publications. In many cases, GANs are used to generate synthetic training data that can be used to train an artificial intelligence system like a, a, a deep neural network. These are images that are actually generated in my lab, and I've been generating synthetic microscopy images for about four years on a separate NIH-funded project where we're looking at fluorescent microscopy images, and one of the things we're currently doing is trying to do um, uh, automatic detection, three-dimensional detection of, of cell nuclei. Um, but the problem is we can't get enough training data. So what we do is we generate synthetic imagery, um, and this is, uh, this is an example of, of some of the images and uh, just to give you an idea of which ones are real and which one's synthetic. So we took this uh, system, it uses something called a spatially constrained cycle GAN or an SP cycle GAN to be able to generate these synthetic images. And I gave them to other members of our team who have a lot of experience at saying, okay, can they detect whether an image is synthetic or not? Particularly, can I detect if an image has been generated by one of these GANs? Um, and I gave them about 25,000 um, synthetic images and a set of real images. And again, we are using these on my NIH-funded uh, project for a good thing, being able to uh, look at um, um, uh, look for nuclei and renal images, uh, work I'm doing with the Indiana University Medical School, and we're getting some really good results. But I gave them these images. And uh, what they were interested in doing and what we're interested in deploying in our system, our scientific integrity system, is being able to detect whether an image has been generated by a GAN or not. 
Now, it turns out two members of our team, uh, and particularly the members from the uh, University of Naples, are, are sort of world recognized experts in looking at detecting GAN generated imagery. We're used, doing this um, in the DARPA Semaphore pro project. And like I said, Matt uh, Turek's going to talk to more and tell you more about that. And so, um, what they did is uh, we, we, they used some of their existing tools um, and uh, they were able to um, uh, use one of these deep learning based approaches and they could detect uh, under certain cir circumstances somewhere between 90 and 100 percent of the images that were GAN generated. OK, and this experiment, I, I don't have time to describe it, but it was a very interesting controlled experiment because what they did is they trained the AI system, the deep learning system, not on microscopy images, but synthetic natural images, like cars, houses, cats, churches, and faces. And that system was robust enough to be used on, um, on synthetic um, microscopy images. Uh, here's another result. You can see a typical uh, receiving operating characteristic curve. Uh, that shows you know uh, we we can with a reasonable false alarm rate we can get pretty high uh, on the accuracy. Along that same line, uh, we were also interested in synthetic Western blot images. Uh, there's been some papers. There was this paper down here, emerging concern of scientific and fraud, deep learning and image manipulation, uh, and this paper I think talked about uh, uh, Western blot images. So members of our team from Milano uh, from Milan um, have been looking at uh, being able to use their uh, GAN detectors to be able to generate uh, synthetic Western blots. So we thought we would first work on generating some uh, Western blots. So you can see some the, some examples of the of the real and the synthetic. Um, we use something called a mod, it's actually a modified pix to pix uh, pipeline. Pix to pix is what particularly one of these uh, GAN like tools. Um, and you can see the thing on the right over here was the was the generated Western blots. And we're showing these to some of our uh, uh, OSI uh, colleagues and HHS colleagues uh, to see how realistic they believe they are. Um, and what we're doing then is we're generating these uh, Western blots, and then we're gonna use uh, these to be able to train a detector so it would be able to detect whether or not a Western blot image was uh, you know, synthetically generated. Um, here's a whole collection. We've generated tens of thousands of these um, of these Western blot images. So these tools, these GAN tools are not quite in the system. They probably won't be in the system for probably, uh, I would imagine a couple of, uh, uh, probably not for a couple of months. We, we still got a lot of things we got to do here. So future work, we're going to extend the system to add more forensic tools, including video forensics and the scan detection tool. We're going to integrate the image graphics, video analysis with text, metadata, and providence. We have a very large uh, project inside uh, the Semaphore, DARPA Semaphore program that we're going to leverage for particularly looking at metadata. Uh, we want to further uh, develop and refine the prototype for integration in typical workflows. Uh, our goal, of course, is to get this thing um, into OSI so they can uh, use it on real cases. And then one of the things, a larger goal we have is we would extend this to other things like manuals, new news articles research proposals, and maybe even other types of uh, documents. So if you want to contact us, you can contact, you can contact me directly, or you can contact the entire team by sending an email to good-science at ecn.purdue.edu. There is a demo of the system that's available, and I, this maybe we can, this link is in the slide deck. If you contact me, I'll give you a copy of the slides. Um, you can, uh, th there is a manual you can look at, and there's about a 15-minute demo you can actually um, see the system running. Um, so I think that's all I have to say, and I'd be more than happy uh, to take some questions. Um, so thank you. <laughs>